Howdy, folks. It's David Cobb. So happy to be with you. Of course, you know I had the honor of serving as the campaign manager for the Stein Baraka campaign. And as we say all the time, in deference to Gil Scott Heron, the revolution may be not be televised, but it will be brought to you over the source of non-corporately filtered news information and analysis. Of course, I'm your host, David Cobb. Democracy in Action is the name of this program on the growing Green News Network. And I'm very excited about the program today because we have with us Anoa Changa. Anoa is an editor at large of the Progressive Army. Anoa, welcome to Democracy in Action. Thank you for having me. How are you doing tonight, David? I'm doing mighty fine, Anoa. And I got to say, I, I want to share with the viewers of Democracy in Action the Progressive Army's tagline. Are y'all ready? No prisoners, no apologies, pure progressivism. So I got to say, I know I, that got my attention from jump, but I also want to jump right in to the piece that you recently helped to co-author called mm -hmm. Whose Revolution Is It Anyway? And I'm going to turn that over to you to give our viewers a taste for what it is that that piece, what, what were you getting at? Uh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you reading and I appreciate you reaching out. Um, if you guys don't know, David and I have gone back and forth. We've done a few interviews on my, my, I also do a show on Wednesday nights, The Way of Fanoa. Um, but this piece, uh, shout out to Andre Roberge and Raven Payne. We have a team of writers, like we are self-funded. Um, Benjamin Dixon founded the Progressive Army about a year and a half ago, approximately. And it's a growing, you know, creative writing space where we cover pretty much everything that's been going on in this 2016 political election cycle, as well as other things that affect our daily lives and, and, and really get to the heart of what it is to be progressive in this current age. With this piece, right, um, Andre approached me. He wanted to talk about kind of what we've seen as like maybe the factions, the various factions on the left within this, you know, Bernie Sanders style uh, uh, progressive movement that we've seen rise up for over the past approximately two years. Um, and one of the things that uh, Andre's out in Washington, so one of the things that he was noticing as an example is some of the issues around the dissolution of Our Revolution Washington, right? Um, Our Revolution is is the the campaign, is the organization that spun off from Bernie Sanders' campaign. And there they're end up being like local affiliate groups, whether they're official affiliates or not. I mean, just depends upon, I guess, the individual organization. But several folks decided to organize around that name locally. And there was some infighting, I guess, in Washington over that name, over the direction they were going and things of nature. But we've seen this play out. You see this between Dim Enter and Dim Exit, right? Um, you see this in so many different areas. So, like, Andre was using it kind of as an example. Also, you looked at Our Revolution TV, um, and which was another initiative, which was a collaborative initiative during the primary, because... When we look at what happened after the primary process, right, we look at the, 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 the Bernie Sanders loss or, as some folks would say, the stolen election that happened in the primary process, we see groups breaking off, right? There wasn't a clear, cogent plan coming out of the primary process going into that after portion in terms of building a movement. Um, there, there, are, there, are, there are large groups that have, you know, coalesced in various places, but you know, there's still a tug of war over what people should be doing. Should they be following Bernie's lead and helping to rebuild the Democratic Party or, or you know, getting in and being unified and all the other stuff? Should they be going, for example, within the Green Party? And several people really did, several people did do that after the primary process, go within the Green Party and help build up local chapters, help, you know, work nationally with the Greens. Should they go and do another third party effort? So one of the things we looked at was kind of some, uh, some examples of, of how this is all playing out. So Andre and Raven, so you know, you that, no, no, go I, ahead. I do want to yeah, because it was really, uh, and folks, you really got to go check out progressivearmy.com. Mm -hmm. Whose revolution is it anyway? Because one of the things, like, I don't want you to gloss past, I know, uh, y'all really nailed, I thought, the notion that the Bernie brand uh, is being used by so many different people, uh, yeah. but haphazardly, right? I mean, I think it's really important that, that folks who are l watching this uh a live stream. And by the way, remember to share and comment on this so we can distribute this conversation uh, because the corporate leaders do not want people like Anoa Changa and David Cobb talking to each other. They especially don't want thousands of you watching our conversation and sharing mm -hmm. it and having conversations mm -hmm. with each other. So let's do that. If for no other reason than to piss off the ruling elite. <laughs> Well, my sub the, the subtitle that I that, that that Andre let me title this. So the subtitle for this was 
Um, the solving into reactive factions undermines progressive action. And, and you're right. And so, and it's not that I'm not necessarily like, you know, we're, we're not accusing people of anything by using Bernie's name, but it's easy to organize. And I'm sure within the Green Party, you know, when you, when you have party leadership and stuff, people see this all the time. I mean, even when you're talking about other things outside of, when you're talking about regular movement organizations, it's easy to, to, to organize around recognizable names, which is why people have a tendency to try and get celebrities to do stuff, right? You know, name recognition helps make it easier, you know, to, to do things. Um, but one of the things that we talk about exactly is exactly right. Like, like there, there's this tension over what do people do now that they've been either re-energized because they had already been moving and engaging. And, and, and David, we've talked about this before. Like, this is a movement moment, right? We've already seen, I mean, really, when you look at post 9-11, we've been in a constant wave of different types of activism. I mean, you know, we've had, you know, large waves of like the immigrants' rights movement. We've had the anti-war movement. We've had the rise of BDS. We've had Black Lives Matter. We've had Occupy. We've had so many different waves of movement that have still and been working. Go moment. ahead. Yeah. Did you did you just see what y'all did? You just see what Anoa did? She just listed off all these things that have been popping off, and those all happened within the last three to five years. See, I've been trying to be a social change organizer for thirty years. This has popped off in ways that has never experienced before. So that the material conditions are shifting. So that look, and let's be very clear. Sadly, young black men like Trayvon Martin uh, have been gunned down uh, in the streets, mm -hmm. sometimes by private people, uh, sometimes by the, uh, the actual police themselves, right? That list is very long, but the reality is that movements are rising up in resistance, calling it out in ways that I had not experienced before, right? right. And, and Black Lives Matter is an example, and it's sustained. Occupy Wall Street sustained itself. These things actually are popping off and are beginning to shift. Something is going on now, and, and I say this with great love and respect, all of that preceded, predated Bernie Sanders. Yeah, and you know, and, and then I say that and I point that out because you know you do have this 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 explosion of a lot of people who had not been directly involved in political activism in this way, right? In terms of you know electoral politics in this manner. But there have been tons of people who've been organizing and working in their communities, working on national policy issues. Um, you know, you you can go all the way back to groups like in Cobra, the Jericho movement, um, critical resistance. I mean, my stepfather has been a part as part of Jericho movement as well as critical resistance resistance and is all old school Black Panther. I mean, there's so many different, you know, down here in the South, we have Project South. We have so many different groups all over. We have Cooperative Jackson and Jackson, Mississippi. So there are tons of groups that have been doing this type of work on varying levels. But what we saw with the Bernie Sanders campaign is we saw this coming together of a lot of like-minded people. And some of these different groups came together within this phase too. They try to do something within electoral politics. Like you really haven't seen probably since the, the when Jesse Jackson ran in the 80s, right? So... So now that once that it was all this hype and it was so much hope and excitement, right? And so once once that dwindles off, you know, especially when you have the disaster that was the DNC convention, and I was not a Bernie delegate because I didn't I didn't have the leave to, to be able to go. But knowing so many people who did travel, um, you know, I have friends who are single moms who work part time. Who, it was a real personal burden to be able to travel, but they felt it was their duty, right? So. After what happens at the DNC, and by now everyone knows like how horribly disrespected not just the delegates were, but you know, watching people that we admire like Senator Nina Turner be disrespected. I mean, there's so many different things happen. People were really split and fragmented on what to do. And even a little bit before that, you started coming out of California. It's like, okay, so what do we do now? And so this past year, it really, you've seen a lot of folks and a lot of different groups trying to figure out and parse out what they should be doing and where they should be going. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk about because. While there's this whole thing within the Democrats about, okay, we need to have unity, but we have not only a fragmented Democratic Party, I mean, you also have a fragmented, you know, so-called progressive movement, left, whatever, with a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. And me personally, I'm not really, I don't know that everybody necessarily needs to do the same exact thing and sing Kumbaya, because I don't believe that, I don't believe that's necessary. I do believe that we need to respect each other and collaborate, cooperate where possible. But I don't believe that we're all going to just fall in line and get information behind Bernie as he embarks on this journey. You know, sometimes our, our, our leaders or our friends or our heroes or whatever we want to call them, sometimes they go places that we're not willing to go with them. And I do believe for me personally, at least he's going down a path that I can't follow him. 
And, and, and well, for me personally, no, go ahead. Yeah, because I, I, this is the thing. Like, we have to understand uh, when the corporate Democrats talk about unity, what they really mean is that we have to just shut up, mm -hmm. sit down, get back to the back of the bus, uh, and get back in line and fall back in line, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting, Anoa, when this so-called unity tour uh, came up from jump. You had Bernie continuing to inspire literally hundreds of thousands of yeah. people. And Tom Perez is the corporate Democrat is either being muted or literally booed at some of these stops. You are seeing uh, Bernie continue his relentless uh, call for single payer health care as a fundamental human right. Uh, his relentless call to take on uh, the billionaire class and Tom Perez refusing to unify under a basic progressive message. Instead, what Tom Perez is trying to do is take the Clinton, and I mean either Bill or Hillary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The Clintonian sort of approach of a mealy mouth, let's say some uh, platitudes, but let's actually not talk about uh, you know either revolution or the billionaire class uh, or single payer right. healthcare. And one of the things I liked about whose revolution is it anyway is like the real challenge. Like, what do we mean by revolution? Right? Absolutely. Uh, talking about restructuring society because I'm going to tell you something. If we are not actually talking about restructuring the social, political, and economic institutions, we're not actually talking about a revolution. We ought to be very clear about that. Right. And the second thing, as an unabashed progressive myself, I think that we have to be absolutely clear that we have to dismantle white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy and the U.S. foreign policy known as empire. That's actually what revolution would look like. Right. And so that's part of what we ultimately get to in the piece. Like, you know, uh, uh, Andre and Raven lay out like some of the different examples and, and like they look at the difference of uh, it was our revolution TV and then it went to our resistance TV. So they lay out some different examples of, of kind of how this tension has manifested itself within, you know, the grassroots movement, so to speak. Right. Um, and then the, the latter part of the piece is like my, you know, kind of sky view, just looking at it overall, because part of my thing is like, it's really easy for us to get caught up in the minutia of conflict, right? But ultimately, like at this, you know, sometimes there's some things that we're just not to agree to disagree on. And if at least we can work in this space right here to do what we're going to do, I might oppose you on these three other things. But if we can work on this one thing right here, then you know what, that, that, that's good enough for me. I'm not going to keep fighting and struggling with people to see it my way because I'm just beating my head against the wall after a certain point. Well, the other so, thing is this, and no, we're going to have disagreements. I mean, hell, I yeah, don't agree with happens. myself. Of the time. You know what I'm saying? It's like, right, so, right, absolutely. And I tell people, if I agree with you 90% of the stuff, then I'd yeah. like to spend 90% of our time working on the things we agree with and 10% of our time grappling and struggling, right? So uh, I know one of the things we do here on Democracy in Action is open it up for comments and questions. So we jump right into it. I haven't even asked for questions, but a couple have already come in. So okay, sure. I want to now invite the viewer, if you've got any comments or questions, uh, to please uh, type them into the comments. Michael O'Neill, our technical director, uh, will capture the ones uh, that uh, and feed them to us. So I'm going to jump immediately to Gino Donati, who asks, why does, is Bernie so dead set on trying to rebuild the Democratic Party when he himself has been an independent his entire career? Anoa, what do you think about that question? <laughs> I plead the fifth. But <laughs> lawyer joke. But no, seriously, um, I think part of it is this this fatalistic view of American politics, right? Like there are many people, even those like Senator Bernie Sanders, who who believe that the only way that that anything can happen because of the way our system of government is set up is because we have these two major party, this two major party system, is that that's going to be the only and best chance because the third party can't possibly win and blah 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 and splitting the vote, you know, all that other good stuff. He is you know, independent, like, but he possibly in slavery. We can't possibly allow women the right to vote. We can't possibly have a 40-hour work week. We can't possibly do any of the damn things that progressives have actually done. So I do want to name that, right? But 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 what I will say, what I will say is that one thing that he has noted several times, which makes me believe if Bernie Sanders lived anywhere else but Vermont, like if he lived in a close party state, I'm pretty sure he'd be a registered Democrat. Like many, there, there are millions of Americans, Americans out there who are registered Democrats because they believe they have to be in order to participate in the process, not because they, they are diehard Democrats, right? Right. Um, it's, it's, 
it's a structural barrier. So that right. I, I, cause I, Tom is moving fast, and Kelly Lorraine Swick Robertson writes in uh, something I know that you're going to like to hear. She says, "Talk about the Progressive Unity Summit." So I, we, we are um, getting there. I just want to make one more point, two point before we get there. Okay. But I'll segue right into that. I promise, Kelly. <laughs> But one of the things I wanted to say, one more thing about this piece is that we really need to be focusing more so on who's in charge, who has the best, you know, who's who's going to be the leader, things like that. We need to be engaging in real time with real people in our communities. And we also need to be able to explain issues in a way that is easy to understand and relates to daily life. We have to be communicating directly with people, right? We can't, we cannot, all these, all these, the sniffing and sniping we do at each other, it's irrelevant. We have about approximately a half of the country that did not engage in the political process in this past election cycle. And quite honestly, increasingly, I don't necessarily blame people for checking out. Um, I don't blame voters for how they vote or how they choose not to vote. Um, we have structural barriers like in Florida, you know, they're trying to get a, a felony restoration of the vote back in. I mean, we've seen some, we have cross checks. Well, we've seen so many different the Green Party of Florida, who is actually part of that coalition. Oh, very good. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they, they, they now have the, the ability to get ballot access for that issue come 2018. And so that's going to be a challenge. So these are the things that we actually need to be working on. We need to set aside that ego and, 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 and really like breaking away from these clicks. And so that segues perfectly into to Kelly's point about the Progressive Independent Party, which is a collaborative effort of multiple groups and party initiatives and looking at this, their second unity summit, which will be happening this August, it's mid-August, um, like August 18th, August 19th in Seattle, um, which is approximately two weeks or so after the democracy convention in, Min in Minnesota. So, I mean, the idea is really bringing together, it's, it's another meeting of the minds events, like really bringing as many grassroots folks together as possible to help, you know, not just collaborate and, and, and share uh, uh, resources and tools and knowledge base, but really start building out what what the, the, these efforts look like going longer term. Um, and I, 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 I want to jump, jump in because I think I really want to lift up the Progressive Independent Party, or PIP, yes. uh, who actually uh, convened the first Progressive Unity Summit uh, mm -hmm. associated with the Occupy inauguration yes. activities uh, that both myself and, and you and others, I mean, you know, we, we, we converged hella people uh, in Washington, D.C. Yes. Uh, yes. in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, but what was really interesting about the uh, Progressive Independent Party's uh, Progressive Unity Summit was a keynote panel that brought together Nick Branna of the Draft Bernie Movement and mm -hmm. Ralph Nader and uh, Jill Stein and uh, a representative of Socialist Alternative to have that conversation. I know, yeah. Inoue, you were on a panel uh, for media. There were, there yeah. were multiple panels, right? But it yep. was a really interesting thing where you actually had people who had some really very fundamental differences about how to engage the electoral process in honest, hard conversation about yep. what that looked like. I thought that was really uh, important. And it's going to be in the next one. It's not even a year later, right? This mm -hmm. that was January, right? And we're yep. going to roll up in August. And the main one will be in Seattle. It's going to be the same weekend as the Hemp Festival, yes. the largest hemp festival uh, in the United States of America. Uh, so there's going to be a great opportunity for pollination. And what's really interesting is that they're talking about doing local and or regional for folks who can't come as well. So I really encourage folk to to go and check out what they're what they're doing at the Progressive Unity Summit. Now, I want to make sure to get to, to uh, Peter Galanak's question or comment, because he, he has a pretty provocative position. He says, look, is Sanders really even a progressive? His history is mixed at best. For me, his support of Hillary Clinton nailed the coffin. We should stop promoting him as a progressive because he is not. Anoa, what's your comment or reaction to that? So I'm not a big label person, right? Because quite honestly, I don't like calling myself progressive because I see behaviors from so-called progressives that I personally don't agree with. But um, is he a progressive? I mean, that's how he identifies. What I do think we need to, we do need to look at the values, not just how well someone speaks, but their actions, right? And what they're doing, what they're saying. And that has come up a, a lot. People would even say like compared to, you know, 
people like abroad or, or in other countries and stuff, he's actually really like more central center than, than, than left. Um, I do think that the idea in terms of at least when you look at who is currently in the U.S. Congress, he is like rather progressive, you know, um, in co- by comparison. So I think when you say progressive by comparison, I'm not about to pull anyone just like I don't go. I don't go around pulling people's black cards. Well, not often, but I'm not going to pull a, a progressive card for anyone. But I, I think that's less important about whether or not who's really a progressive, because we saw a lot of that arguing about what's progressive and what's not, because really that's such an amorphous concept. Right. And we need to have very specific, you know, uh, 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 ideas or policies that we're talking about. And the more specific we get, the more we're better able to pin down people and where they are versus these terms. Because, you know, we, we, we saw that with Hillary Clinton and like mainstream media, like, well, I'm a progressive. Well, of course she's a progressive. And of course this person's a progressive. I mean, it, all of that, who that jockeying over titles and labels that really gets us nowhere. When we really start looking at where people stand so and I like, think, no, go ahead. Important because like the, like the reality is that Bernie Sanders is calling for single payer, Healthcare is a fundamental human right. Mm-hmm. He is talking about uh, shifting away from coal and oil uh, and nuclear power to sustainable right. alternative energy. He is talking about changing uh, the economic system in a, in a real meaningful way. So if you were sort of going down on most domestic issues, for my way of thinking, we would find that those are progressive values. But I do appreciate Peter's point because I'm going to say this. Yes. When it comes to foreign policy issues and when it comes to U.S. imperialism, Bernie yes. Sanders is not a liberal. His uh, foreign policy, you know, he is actually, frankly, pretty hawkish. You know, he is he, he's not uh, like his foreign policy is not what I would call a pacifist or uh, even liberal, much less a progressive foreign policy. Well, that, that gets nope. into that gets into like how we see, and this is something I mentioned to you via email earlier today. Um, how we really see so-called progressives in their defense of Bernie Sanders and this defensive decisions he's made, really doing the same dance we've seen Democrats do for the longest with the lesser of two evils nonsense. Right? We spent almost two years rejecting this lesser of e- lesser of two evils concept. I um, mean, those who went on to actually ultimately vote for Jill Stein or one of the other third party candidates across the country, like Gloria Lavariva, um, you know, Monica Moorhead. I mean, there were so many other people who ran also as third parties in, in various areas. For those people who re- continue to reject that, it's, it's, it's astounding to hear people say, well, you know, you know, this is what we have to do now to win or this. Will be and I'm just sitting here. I'm like, you people just helped run an election cycle where we rejected that argument. But now we're back to the same old, you know, standard bearer lines of the Democratic Party. And it's really problematic. So I don't disagree with that at all. I think that's actually a really great point. I just don't really care about, lab- about, 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 about what people are calling themselves because the proof is in the pudding. Right. And like you just laid out, I mean, he had a really great speech, you know, countering a- the APEC you know, uh, a, a meeting about dealing with, you know, Israel and the state of Palestine, you know, Palestinian state and things of that nature. But like you just said, on all these other indicators in terms of militarism, I mean, he's not that much, he's not that far off from Hillary Clinton, right? Like, so there's some differences, but but really in the grand scheme of things, so listen, like he was so pretty hawkish uh, himself. One thing I want to do is get us out of- so I want to get us out of the Bernie focus. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another thing that that I've heard you talk about Anola, and that is a real concern around being willing to throw, for example, women's reproductive rights under the bus uh, for the sake of expediency or winning. And I want yes. to see the case, uh, give you the, the space and the platform uh, to, I presume, indict that position. <laughs> Well, I'm sure, you know, given your experience and background as a lawyer, you would agree with me in terms of the fact that I, I will. You don't. <laughs> because, you know, we can't when we're talking about people on the left. Right. Whether you consider yourself progressive, liberal, whatever, Democrat, green, whatever you consider yourself, however you define yourself. If you're someone that's on to the left of, you know, Republicans or whomever, and you're willing to say, oh, we can't let social issues divide us or all this other nonsense. You know, this is not about social issues. You know, that's somebody's pet issue and it's dividing us. I mean, there's a real concern here right now. We saw this whole dust up with the Democratic Party and the, the mayoral candidate for, for Omaha last week, um, you know, last several days and people trying to bend over backwards and explain and rationalize or or they're upset. And I mean, just all types of nonsense. But bottom line is for too long, Democrats have allowed 
whether they're um, anti, you know, LGBTQ uh, uh, Democrats, like in North Carolina, I think it was like 10 Democrats in North Carolina that actually were a part of passing HB, HB2, which is also anti-worker, um, when it first was passed the first time in North Carolina, or you have your Blue Lives Matter, pro-Blue Lives Matter governor, which is who's a Democrat down in Louisiana. I mean, this whole notion of these conservative Democrats, everyone's like, oh, we got to reach out to conservatives, we got to do this. The bottom line is when we're, we're talking about fundamental rights, when we're talking about constitutionally protected liberty interests, there is no negotiating. There is no compromise, right? So so it's not about, oh, that's what your personal opinion or position and, is. And that's the other thing. Yeah, go ahead. Like we can't we can't do that. Yeah, the other go ahead. Thing, I think it's really important. Like if we if if we are going to actually get a like words are labels to communicate ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with with labels. I have a problem with consistently utilizing them. So I want to be very clear. Uh, the Democrat candidate for mayor in Omaha stand by his anti-choice position and then expects and frankly Bernie Sanders stands by him because he's got good economic issues that is a problem that yeah. is diluting the language itself I cannot and will not actually uh, uh, throw a women's reproductive right under the bus for the sake of expediency for the sake of winning an election uh, and the reality is and actually uh uh, Michelle Marie actually writes in and says, our bodily autonomy is not for sale. Bernie it's not, and it's a constitutionally protected right, which is, which is, I don't think a lot of people are understanding this, right? There's this thing called the Constitution. There's things called liberty interests. It's a protected right. It's well established. I mean, we do have to keep fighting to make sure we have our rights the same way Black people and Latino people still got to fight to make sure they can vote. But these are well established rights that exist. And so where do we draw the line? And it is an economic issue. Particularly if you're a poor woman in the South or in, in rural communities elsewhere, I mean, this you know, reproductive justice, reproductive choice is an economic issue. So, so these, 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 and so I don't disagree with people who are pointing out how hypocritical Democrats and others are being by only pointing out this one candidate in this one instance. Because there's a history of this, you know, with with with, with Democrats accepting BS for people because they got to win from that Republican seat. But we don't win. We don't actually trans form the political system by simply doing what has always been done or by trading away people's rights. Because because what's next? Because right now, black folks and brown folks are fighting for various different rights that they're entitled to. And, and so the Democratic Party, which, which they already have traded us away on numerous occasions. So this is a lesson and a sign that we have to continue to challenge these, um, these notions. I, I that got, people have. I, again, I will say, it, I've said it before, I will say it again. In electoral politics, if you get taken for granted, you mm -hmm. just got taken. And yep. the reality is the Democratic Party leadership takes for granted women, people of color, immigrants, organized labor, environmentalists. We have been taken for granted time after time after time. And so for me, I think it's time for actually to come together and say, actually, there are a core set of values that we actually adhere to, and we're going to assert them, we're going to struggle for them, and we're going to win people over to the idea of a peaceful, just, democratic, and ecologically sustainable society. Oh, and look at that. I just named the four pillars of the international <laughs> Well, what the, 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 the final thing I'll say about this topic, what I, what I find so astounding about all this is right now, and when I make the point about these are constitutionally protected rights, right? Uh, people are like, oh, well, we all, you can be, if you want to be anti choice or pro life in your personal opinion, that's your business. But if you're going into elected office and you say you to support you, then you need to be upholding that you swear to uphold the Constitution. And a part of that also comes the legal jurisprudence that has been, you know, adjudicated over the last several, you know, decades, at least in terms of women's reproductive rights, that you need to be upholding that. And that just needs to be the basic requirement and it needs to be explained to people accordingly. But what I find so fascinating is at the same time as we're willing to, to compromise on women's rights, all something that's constitutionally protected, we're throwing hissy fits, and I say we loosely, but we have, you know, people, liberals, leftists, whomever on the left, you know, upset that people won't let Ann Coulter or, or Richard Spencer speak. So we can support and protect the freedom of speech of racists, but you're not willing to, to, to fight and protect and support 
the constitution protect the rights of women. Like I, I, I don't, I don't understand how we're playing, you know, this game right now. But I don't like it, and well, it's I a problem. You do understand, right? I do I understand. <laughs> I think you do understand. And listen, I know this this time just flew by as it was. So I'm going to ask the, the viewers of Democracy in Action and the Green News Network to do like you've always done and, and helped us out so much. Please make sure to share this on your own Facebook or uh, you can email the link at watchgnn.tv. Uh, Let's make sure to keep these conversations going. Voices like Anoa Changa and programs like The Way with Anoa and Democracy in Action only exist because you are actually making us uh, are sharing that information. So comment on this, share it on your own uh, page. That's very vital uh, and very important. Email it. I do want to uh, give you an opportunity, Anoa, for some final thoughts. Um, well, thank you again for letting me. Ooh, excuse me. Thank you for letting me let me join you tonight. I know we had talked about doing it a little let down the road, but this worked out very well. Um, again, like no matter who you vote for, who you build with or belong to, organization wise, really get out there in your communities, or at least with even within your own family. Like it all makes a difference. We can all do the little bit that we can do wherever we can, however we can. Um, it really. I mean, this is the long game, right? I mean, there have been people, you know, David, you know, many other people have been out there doing this for decades at this point. But I mean, I really do believe that we're we're, we're moving in the right direction and we have been, but we just got to try to continue to build up the systems that we need to actually transform, um, you know, the landscape in a way that that's not just sustainable, but maintain, <laughs> that's sustainable, but as well as engaging for a large Sec sec sector of, of society and not just, you know, the very top elite few. You can catch me um, Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. My Check me out on Facebook, The Way With Anoa, website, same title, Twitter, same handle, Instagram, et cetera. So, David, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for letting me join tonight. Thank you so much, folks. You've been We've been talking with Anoa Changa, uh, editor-at-large of Progressive Army, uh, all-around kick-ass revolutionary and good friend. Uh, I also want uh, folks to remember at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, tomorrow, candidates and campaigns working group are going to have a, uh, so you're thinking about running for office. On Wednesday, Jill Stein will be back with her, with her, with her own uh, program. Uh, Ajamu comes back on Thursday, and on Saturday, the People's Climate March. Thanks so much for joining in. Peace.